Hello, beautiful people, and welcome to the Occult Explorers. I'm Snappy, and I'm joined, as always, by my good friend and co-host, Dion. How's it going, Dion? Hello, hello. Hello, hello. And we have a couple special guests this evening. So, uh, right up front, we have Buffy of Occult Explorer. How's it going, Buffy? It's going good. I just literally walked in the door from a short vacation, so excuse the 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 unmakeup. <laughs> no You're worries. still on vacation. Don't worry. I know nobody cares. I'll just say it. And Ryan here is struggling to join. Oh, there we go. And Ryan, Ryan Seven has joined us. How's it going, Ryan? Are we live? We are live. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, the universe. Hello, everybody. Hello, Dion. Hello, Mrs. Occult Examiner. <laughs> you all right, Buffy? You all right, Snappy? Good to be here. Yeah, yeah, I'm great. Life is good. Life is good. I'm excited today because we're going to be talking about the Great Eclipse. This is kind of a huge, intense situation for a lot of different people around the world. Um, it's something that's going to be crossing directly over the United States. Uh, Dion made a short presentation for us to get into it. And um, my friend Graham sent us a poem that we're going to read to start things off here. Uh, but before we get into it, uh, Ryan, do you know anything or have any feelings about the Great Eclipse? I feel like it's happening on the other side of the planet. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, is it, I, I is it like visible it. from where you are at all? or No. No, <laughs> no they're all... Yeah, the yeah, it doesn't really happen like that. <laughs> uh, it's a big shadow, basically, and everyone's getting all concerned. Uh, concerned, con concerned. I'm sure CERN fits into this uh, conspiratorial. Well, that's kind of funny. They point. are. They're apparently. Don't quote me on this, but I have read people making saying that CERN had plans for during the eclipse to do some weird stuff. Yeah, and I mean, I'm not in any of that. CERN is cool in my books. <laughs> yeah. They do do some odd things. They, they, you know, like when you get high level smarty people and they have spiritual or religious leanings, oh, they're, cool. they're going to be looking at the occult, aren't they? So, yes, the occult and CERN go hand in hand. They've got a big Cali statue out the front where they got caught doing occulted rituals out there. Occulted means anything that's not Christian, basically, doesn't it? That's what I mean, right? Like, I'm I'm not concerned with the people at CERN. I don't. I'm not into this. I don't think that they're like opening portals through space time or out as some kind of like black demonic craziness. You're boring, Snappy. You got to have some imagination about these things. <laughs> oh gosh. Maybe, maybe we're gonna have to force you to watch the the initiation or the opening ceremony for CERN. If you if any of you've seen that when they're coming out of the tunnel. Yeah, they had right. a grand opening parade for it. And cool. it, yeah, they had a Lucifer with horns and they had zombies coming out. Nice. <laughs> I kid you not. I kid you not. That's CERN. Well, um, I mean, you've got to think if you were making CERN a sci fi thing, it would be some kind of portal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a big ring, a big door. Yeah, who, who knows what goes on at CERN? I mean, CERN is crazy because it's so much power and right. not, it's very Luciferian in the amount of knowledge that's there and the fact that it if anything's going to go crazy on this planet, that, that's up there on the top list. Any of these massive projects where you have like such colossal amounts of money and intelligence and everything on the table, of course, of course there's... And create incredible stuff going down. I just think it is what it says it is, you know. <laughs> but portal? it's still incredible. No, I think it's, <laughs> about it's, it's it's about examining the fabric of reality and trying to trying to see particles, you know, um, which is equally as magical. It's just you know, <laughs> I don't it's, think it's they're they're more, breaking. More magical. Yeah. Right. Like examining the world is the most magical thing you can do. So, but in terms of the eclipse, I do think the eclipse is kind of wild. You know, this whole idea, when I was looking into some of this mythology of eclipses, 
right? Um, some of the earliest stuff I found was coming out of Mesopotamia, Babylon, mm -hmm. somewhere. Yeah. And it's this idea that when the eclipse would happen is when you would have regime change. Okay. And it was the king. Um, it was the king getting worried. The king um, would get like, worried and would do all these festivals because he would assume that there was going to be a literal eclipse, right? There was going to be an insertion of power, right? You might Whereas imagine that this caused him to actually right. go and get some astronomers on the case. And may maybe it's these reasons of paranoia. It, it might be one of the reasons why astronomy and astrology got a bit more detailed and a bit more uh, cal calculative. Oh, for sure. I definitely think that because some of the earliest astronomy we have from Babylon is actually clack clocking the eclipses. And they were able to determine like the cycles of eclipses and the number of general eclipses and could predict them e extraordinarily accurately. Now, of course, we've, we've surpassed them, but their methodology held firm for most of human history, right? And it's just so incredible. And it's about this idea of this power and the flipping of poles, something we've talked mm -hmm. often on this on this channel. And another image that strikes me, and I was talking with my friend Rich about this, is when you look at the um, the eclipse, it's the merging of the sun and the moon for a moment. It's that intertwining, the love making the embracing of the masculine and the feminine to one singular form. So it's this alchemical merger and it's this reemergence of that Fani's image, right? That divine androgyne, which I, you know, connect with and think is, is, is super powerful. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I think to add to that as well, you have an extra D an added detail. It's not like we can see the moon uh, as some luminary and then the sun comes in and and eclipses that it's it's the moon eclipsing the sun so there's something of this feminine winning out over the masculine for a moment you know they don't last long eclipses five minutes eight minutes but yeah. there's an th there's a little bit of black sun in there if you ask me as well you know That's the true. idea that when we see a black sun it is almost like a black disc with with white energy coming off the edge, which is very it, much like the image of an eclipse. And I think that, really that feminine point. overtaking the masculine yeah. is why it has yeah. bad portents attached to it. I can see Ooh. that completely. And we know how deep an alchemical symbol the black sun is. It's like a central theme in, in a lot of those early alchemical texts, especially out of the European tradition. And then we know this is Dionysus as well in the earlier Greek tradition, the black sun. So Mithras really powerful in, in, stuff. Sorry. Yep. And Saturn, we connecting just... to this idea of Saturn, right? Um, and again, with that I idea of the usurpation of cycles, right? Uh, Saturn in a lot of the early mythologies was thought to have been the original sun, who then was replaced by his son, Zeus, who became the current sun. And this changed the current celestial formation and hierarchy, you know? Um, in alchemy, it was actually called the best sun, the old sun, the superior sun. So yeah. again, that's that's a good point. It's it's wild stuff. What do you think about all this, Buffy? Before we get into Dion's presentation, I think it is a very very important forgotten aspect. It's all it's riddled throughout pop culture, and uh, I and talk about sign symbols through pop culture. I uh, my friend used to work at a mass producing uh, magazine company in Chicago a long time ago in the 90s. And he was talking to me about the subtle messages that they would put in beer or cigarette advertisements like dead babies. Like he would tell me that we did that. That's what we did. We were trying to subtly tell people that these were not great for you. They could kill you. So, um, if they were just doing those little tiny things, then, I mean, that's just like a small window into the type of subtleties that is thrown on us each day. And the black sun is huge in pop culture. Mm. I know it's like, okay, that's, 
that took a left turn there, but it, you know, I usually take left hooks there. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's important enough for people to get serious about studying about the mystery behind it well know? this is one of the big things though honestly is that um i find that a lot of the craziness surrounding this image of the black sun is is hyperbolic especially modern stuff like um in the new age and in the christian era like it's it's designed to vilify alchemy and it's designed to attack you know pagan pagan ideals largely and it has become kind of a cartoon figure so we also have to remember that like the, like there's so much of this kind of this the r warfare going on with all these memes mimetic warfare and all these different um, ideologies vying for control over how people perceive. And the truth is often somewhere in the middle. It's some kind of gray, you know? So any, that's all we got to bear in mind with a lot of this stuff, right? I also uh, wondered if the black sun could be like when they talk about the light within us mm -hmm. that we don't ever see. Um, I wondered like if the black sun would have been like that light within us connected to our uh, pineal gland or not. Well, you know? We have to remember too, like a lot of these pagan traditions, they are examining the more negative and the more um, destructive aspects of reality, things that um, a lot of people have deep issues with and become terrified of, and then, you know, cast dispersions upon, right? Like, but I think that there's a great um, wealth to understanding something like, the black sun or the solar anus, this, this, the negative aspects of growth of that power, right? You know, and if you, if you do not take any image and examine its yin and its yang, then you're never getting the full image. And we can't, we have to examine something like the sun, which is so central and powerful. If you don't examine the negative side, you're missing out on so much of creation. Like someone like, we, Dion and I are huge Bataille fans. We reference him all the time. And Bataille talks about the idea of excess and the excesses of growth and what people do with the excesses of growth as the central defining feature of humanity. This is mm, pure the black chair. sun, right? The cursed chair. Yeah. This is pure black sun kind of mysticism, right? What do you do with all this growth? There's so much negative there, right? There, there's well, all of the potential. Right. Yeah, it needs to be let out, and it is the most potent force. That's why it's the sun. It is, yeah. as Buffy was saying, it's the light of your dreams. It, it's the light. It's the energy that powers your unconscious. It is the unconscious. It, it's that, uh, oh, she's sexy. Let's go and pursue that. It's that feeling. It's that, uh, oh, that felt good. Let's do that again. Or that was frightening. Oh, I think that was thrilling enough for me to engage with it again. There's a right. there's an addictive part of it because you've got this accursed share, this amount of energy from somewhere in you that needs to have something done with it that you can't do anything useful with <laughs> for some reason. It just needs to be let out. It needs to be let out, which is why the creation of art is so essential, right? Because art and sex and it creates a release for this stuff. And if it's not released through art and sex, it's going to come out as violence or something worse, you know? Mm -hmm. And this yeah. is the reality of the accursed share, right? It needs to be transformed. Um, so yeah, lots of wildness there. But before we get into Dion's presentation, I just want to do a quick reading of a poem that Graham sent us. So Graham <laughs> sends his love. Everyone, Graham is the co-host for oh. our other sister show, Searching love, for Dragons. Graham. So uh, much love, Graham. Love Thank you for sending us this. So I'll just give this a quick read and then Dion will take over. So Eclipse by John Steffler from That Night We Were Ravenous. Near noon it will happen. For 27 years there will not be another. And we will be alive then. Will we be together? As the birds grow anxious in the trees and the light tightens to smoke blue. The sad thought of you alone in your studio, me alone, here with my gadgets of words, is a darkening thought that will not be put right. And I walk as fast as I can through the blade, bled streets, but your studio's empty. 
And will the dark come then while I'm not in a parking lot, mistaken, unconnected to this place or that? I put myself into your absent body, into your feelings and face, your own restless loneliness. And I head toward the post office, the store, thinking, somehow this is a testament of my intuition, of our sympathies, telepathy or delusion, apart or together when the snapshot from heaven is taken. This memory happening now, this crucial memory, and there you are walking toward me carrying milk, your, your face sad and tilted toward the ground, until you see me, the clap of gladness we make coming together, lined up with the sun and moon at our heads, the earth at our feet, the blurred shadows of branches trembling around us, about to come undone, about to break into script or tears or racing flame. Nice. What do you guys think? It's gorgeous. Really intense. Yes, but I love is. this image, uh, the clasp of gladness we make coming together, right? Mm -hmm. And the image of the earth and the sun at our feet, the sun and the moon at our heads, right? That eclipses the merging of the male and the female. It's that love, mm -hmm. right? And it happens as above, so below. Powerful poem. Thanks, Graham. All right, Dion. Turning over the reins to our master of ceremonies. Here you go. Oh, well, you got the first pick up. Tomorrow will be eclipse, and it ain't going to happen where Ryan's at. But in America, people are celebrating. Um, people are getting ready. You got to wear glasses. They're selling merchandise. Some evangelicals think it's going to be the second coming uh, due to its uh, how close it is to this year's Easter. Because Easter originally was supposed to take place with the eclipse. Um, Did you guys see Marjorie Taylor Greene was shouting about that? She was saying that all Christians need to repent because of the eclipse and the yeah. and, you know and the earthquake that happened in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of the evangelicals are going wild right now. Um, in previous episodes, we talked about how in New Mexico, uh, the order los penitentes. Um, they would do mock crucifixions as well as real crucifixions. And if there's an eclipse, especially, and the New Mexico authorities would be warned about that. Like, hey, these guys are gonna go out there and try to do some crucifixions during the eclipse. So they're already warned about this as well, because this one is more special than the last one. But remember that last one we had over New Mexico. So just to remind people, okay, the order of the penitents, this is like a worldwide Catholic Brotherhood, and they're kind of infamous for conducting these um, mock crucifixions in which members will be stuck upon a cross, and it varies in intensity. And some of the some of the accusations are in places like the Philippines and these rural areas that these guys are engaging in pretty much full crucifixions where they are hammering these people to boards. And in other places, they're simply tying them. But this is an ongoing kind of intense ritualized um, reenactment of the crucifixion by the most intense of Catholic believers. Yeah. And in, in ancient cultures, there would be traditionally sacrifices during eclipses because some people thought they had to give uh, the sun an offering to bring it back. There was death. It needed it needed a sacrifice of blood. Um, and we also talked in a previous episode about where Buffy's at, Tennessee. Um, some of the cultic stuff there with the uh, mounds, with the Egyptian connections. Go to the next pick. There you go. X marks the spot. Um, if you could see that line that's going through the middle of both of those uh, eclipse lines is the Mississippi River. And some people posit that's like the Nile River, and that's why they named, because of those big mounds, a lot of the Egyptian uh, towns and cities in this part of the world were named after Egyptian names. And so there's a little more to it. So you can see here in 2017, there was already an eclipse there, and the one coming up tomorrow, and that's right over the Cahokia Mounds. And we talked about those before. These special mounds in Illinois were... Uh, they're like Chocolate Canyon. They were playing games and a lot of wild stuff was taking place there. Um, the thing about it, they call this region Little Egypt 
and Southern Illinois. That is the term, Little Egypt. Go to the next pick. Yeah, and so here we got Southeastern Illinois College. And their symbol is a pyramid. It used to be a sphinx, and their animals, the falcon, like Horus. Um, and this is called Little Egypt, this little section. And not only that, some of the names of the towns were Karnak and Thebes and Cairo. Mm -hmm. All of them having problems with lynchings and racial problems. Go to the next pick. You can see here's the town of Cairo right there. And this is in this region where the eclipse is going to go over. And uh, the historic downtown Cairo. It's, it's a ghost town now. Why? Go to the next pick. This. They're doing these lynchings there back in the day. And you can see they're climbing up on poles just to see. In a frenzy, going into a wild frenzy to see this hanging. We talk about this, this tarot image, the hanging. That's what this is about. It's crazy. And so there is some wild energy in this neck of the woods. In the middle of nowhere. And we also got mounds there. These sacred mounds. Um, that we were talking about before. That, that are like the Great Pyramid of Egypt. The base of it is. Um, let's go to the next pick. Boom. And so even the seal for the mm -hmm. region there, Southern Illinois, you could see it has a sphinx on the flag of Southern Illinois. And it has the two trees right there. We know about those two trees on each side, the two poles. It's already set up on the seal. Um, and you have the Nile too, the river. Wow. Yeah. Holy crap. Yeah. <laughs> and, they and they consider the Great Pyramid Cahokia. Which we talked about in the previous video, where the where the eclipse is going to go over. Go to the next pick. Get a little to the magic. Before we go, we would probably want to fumigate, and this is from one of the statues from Made in Cahokia. And what's funny, you can see his headpiece on top. He has the two knobs, and this is yeah, a pipe. horns. Yeah, horns, and it's a pipe, and he's hitting a pipe, mm. fumigating. Your um, pipe, you, so when you smoke your pipe, you're fumigating your guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Awesome. Oh, yeah. It goes deep. And this is from Coke. Yeah. Um, so much ritual stuff going on there. 1050 AD. It declined, though. And now and then it became a ghost town. And people talk about it. It was a thriving uh, epicenter, trading with the Aztecs, trading with Chaco Canyon. And it had a lot of the qualities that Chaco Canyon had including elongated skulls, psychedelics, gambling, and weird games. And astrology connected to the sky. So go to the next pick. That's it right there. That's Cahokia, the mound, where the eclipse is going to go over. And it's funny because the eclipse goes over it at different parts of the of time in different directions. You saw the orbit? You saw the orbit on that first picture of the map? Yeah. Because it deals with procession and equinox. This is something that Ryan fully understands. It's over our heads. Um, <laughs> this thing is a calculator. It's connected to the stars. Um, go to the next pic. This is a recreation of it, what it would have looked like. In the middle, you see those two poles in that little court. That's the chunky court where they play these games. Now, here's the thing. Um, what they found here at Cahokia is... They, they had a burial. It's called Mound 72. And underneath it was virgins, 53 virgins. And they were strangled. It dealt with the strangulation again uh, with the rope. And, and it was with the king. It was a burial with the king. And there was also chunky symbols and a lot of weird symbols. Now, in Cahokia, you'll find swastikas, crosses, poles, a lot of weird iconography that you'll see around the world along with mounds that's all calculated to the stars in their game that they would play. So let's hit the next pick. That's it right there, the wood hinge. Now, originally there was a wood hinge there. That's a calculator. It would have calculated mm. the eclipse, and then they would have done looks, some sacrifices and played some games. This looks ex the exact same as the uh, the pole site we saw at Eleusis, where they were, where they were, doing, where they were um, threshing the grain. Yeah, yeah. Well, it could be a, it could be a threshing core. It could be the maple. Um, people call it a shivalinga. Well, it looks There's, like a Cairo symbol if you look at the crosses on the ground and ignore the, right. the poles. It's a Cairo symbol. That's and right. That's true. And they consider this Cairo. That's why we showed you Cairo down the street. This is called Little mm. Egypt. And so what they did was they dismantled this, and on top of it, 
are they buried was the virgins 53 virgins strangled they took so they they, they put the virgin burial on top of the wood hinge and people wonder if that's part of hinges around the world if you find burials underneath so let's go to the the next pick I want to get into some of the, the culture there because they had elongated skulls with the nobility. We were talking about that before, the headboarding. Um, there was also another culture there called the Burdash culture, the Inoka. It needs to be transformed. Two spirits. These are the, yeah, you, you're shaking your head. You know what, what it is. Yeah. Oh, These yeah. were the men that dressed as females and presented as females and were trained as female shamans and had certain privileges that other men couldn't have. Um, Got lovely hair. And, and, and they were called the Burdash Shade Society by the French because when the French got there, they go, What's this? Who are these dudes dressed as women? And they explained to them, Nah, the, these are a whole other class of shamans. So people uh, say that they're connected to the Manitous. If you've ever heard of the Manitou spirits or the, that deal with the Manitou shamans, but there's a whole class of them. And like you said, they were trained in the women's language the women's ways and women's shamanism because in this culture there were women shamans that's amazing yeah from my my research and studies it, it it really varies from um indigenous community to community across north america but there was a predominance of, of these cultures that would have third and fourth genders right and usually this would be some kind of two-spirit identity where people would because um, the belief in a lot of these indigenous spiritualities, and similar to the Greek even, is that a lot of people are made up of multiple spirits, you know, and like um, you have more than one side in you. And um, most people, you know, their spirits are in congruence, right? Like, like, like you have two masculine, two feminine, but there are some people with a masculine and a feminine or, you know, where things get a little mixed up. Um, and it's, it's, again, it's very cultural dependent um, and it's similar to the Greek idea where like in the, you have the ancient myth where um, humanity was originally uh, two people were merged at the back, were two headed. And Zeus, afraid of our power, splits us in two, male and female, dividing us, forever separating us. And then there's this longing. That's what love is, is trying to find your other half. You know, that's where a lot of this mythology comes from. But this is something that you'll see in a, a large variety of cultures. And I just want to remind people like, um, you know, um, non-binary and kind of um, trans identities, even, you know, and two-spirit identities are very ubiquitous across the entire globe, you know. Love it. And I like the term two-spirit. Because that really sets it up for people to understand something that makes people feel uncomfortable. Two spirit. We, we're all embodying multiple spirits in us. You know, it's a, it's a reflection of who we are. So there's other societies there. Besides this society, there was a warrior society and a gaming society and gambling society, just like Chocolate Candy. And so I'm going to go to the next pick. Boom, right there. So this is a game called Chunky where they get lacrosse from, but it was special, very special, this game right here. Um, that was called the chunky disc right there, which was a stone that was uh, concave on each side. We've been talking about chargers and plates in the past episodes. Mm. So this deals with that symbolism of this type of a plate or a disc and a stick and a spear in his hand. You'll see those are the two, the two symbols, a, a masculine and a feminine. And it's a game that deals with the merchant of both. Um, put it in both. <laughs> go to the next pick. That's from ancient Sumer. Right there, you could see uh, what is that Enki with his uh, yeah. with the disc right there, and you can see the symbol on ancient Sumerian uh, cuneiform, not the statues. It's about male and female. Well, at Cahokia, it was a game, and it was a gambling game. And the way it worked is you would throw the disc and you would throw the spear and the person that threw the spear closest to where the disc landed, or you could stop it, would win the game. Mm -hmm. People would come around to that city, just like Chaco Canyon. And there was revenue that was generated by this game. Um, and political, there was uh, political alliances or they would stop wars based on the game. 
instead of going to war, let's play a chunky game. And then that'll, that'll determine the outcome. Um, it's rumored people write about the French write about that people would kill themselves after some of the games that they would lose because they would bet all their money on it. people would get high. They would get really wild at these games and they were attached to the stars. <laughs> like where the, where the ball would land would be symbolic of the, the planets in the field around the pole. Cause there was poles, mm -hmm. there was two poles that was involved in the game. Um, and these two poles, some people call it, Oh, walk them boas. You know, Masonic yeah. people might say that. And it deals with the uh, with the trajectory or the orbit between these two poles. And that would be the it, outcome of the gambling games. It's the pole of the Earth and the pole of the ecliptic. Is what yes. it is. Thank you for explaining it to me. Because I know that it's very deep. And people are saying mm. these are rustic, primitive Indians. But yet they had a complex system that they could align to the soul. They knew when there was going to be solar eclipses. And they played games based on that. And they would, instead of going to war, they would have these chunky games. And there's a little more to it. Um, even, you know, Tadaho, which is snakes in hair. And we talked about Hiawatha. Um, supposedly, the way the Iroquois Feder Federation came together, one of the other myths is through lacrosse. It was through lacrosse that, through, instead of fighting, let's play lacrosse games with each other. You know, that way we don't have to kill each other. And we well, lacrosse is a huge deal, yeah, among the Haudenosaunee and the various peoples up here. Like, there were rumors, that, like, I've heard about some games going for weeks and involving, you know, hundreds to thousands of people, right, to play these lacrosse games. They were, they were entirely mock warfare, right? It was to, it was a way to, like you were saying, to, 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 to solve all of these massive issues and to determine who could rule in some, in some things, you know? Yeah, and the game was based off of male and female elements. Played on a field laid out that dealt with precession, elliptical orbits of our planet. Pretty wild, huh? Let's go to the next pick. Well, if you think about, <clears throat> excuse me, the shape of football fields is very, um, very vaginal. And so that makes a lot of sense. I've heard a lot of people reference the shape of football fields to female parts. Well, oh, on yeah. that same theme, I was just discussing tonight again, that uh, baseball is a Masonic square and compass. So you've got, you know, the compass being female and the square being male so you've got these same themes running over and over again as we just had in that image from babylon sumaria with the with the the rod and the the reel of of hemp rope is what it is and that's how they delineate areas and do architecture with stuff like that so again it's these yeah uh, a combination of masculine and feminine all the time and as dion said they're obsessed with the stars absolutely obsessed with it Mm -hmm. And so here, that's one of the playing fields right there for the game of Chunky. Notice they got that big pole. They also got those two poles because that's important. That, that deals with measuring stars and astrology, astronomy. And they believe that the random outcome of the game uh, dealt with the random outcome of nature mm. because that's how nature is. It's random. And they would just trust it. We wouldn't trust that. Right now, somebody said, "Hey, Cordell, will you will you trust your 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 car payment based on the flipping the dice?" <laughs> you won't do that. But back then, they it would seems trust. it seems very much like the casting of lots, and and that you know the gods will have their will done to that random occurrence. Well, exactly. When we talked about when we talked about Chikokia the first time, I had brought up the Uman and Thurman right, from, from Hebrew culture. And these are largely thought to have been dice or lots. And the idea was is that nothing was up to chance, right? God is the sole dictator of the universe. So you would throw the dice and the dice would dictate everything. And this is a common belief. You just change it from being God to something else, right? To time or to the universe or to the great mother or the great spirit, right? That's right. So let's hit another pick. All right. That's one of the statues that was found there. Along with that other weird statue where the guy was uh, smoking. 
Here's one of a chunky statue. Now, in his left hand would have been the spear or the rod. And then his right hand is that the chunky stone, that disc, that weird disc. Um, and he had a cone head. And he would wear these weird conical hats. We've seen these conical hats um, in a lot of myths. The Phrygian With, cap, right? Yeah, yeah, you know. And they also did head binding. They, they were doing head binding amongst nobility here. So amongst the statuaries, though, was some another interesting statue. Go to the next statue. Was this statue right here? I'm going to break down this statue. Three pics of it. Um, this is known as the Lucifer, the Morning Star. This is a uh, remin reminiscent of the Morning Star called Redhorn. Um, you can see he has earrings, and it was about he who wears human earrings. If you can see on his ear, there's earrings. Um, around his neck is beads that look like a snake. His head is in a weird knot in the back, and on the front of his head is a weird disc. It almost looks like a chunky, one of the chunky discs that they play the game with. Um, go to the next pick. So that's his back right there. So you could use him as a smoking vessel or drinking vessel as well, or as a flute, if you know how to uh, hook it up. He has a cape of feathers, which was special to the shamans there. And you can see he has a side lock as well, like the Egyptian side lock. It's braided on the side. He's wearing um, skull or human head earrings with the snakeskin beads around his neck with this weird plate on his head. Um, you've seen like in the, the Hebrew traditions where they put the plate on the head or the, the box. Um, so go the Tekelet, go to the next picture. Yeah, right there. Look, boom. And so this is from the front. So you can see he has the side lock, um, the skull or human head earrings. And on the front is a special symbol. That's a, like a chunky stone, but with copper plates and it has a vulva on it. You can see the vulva so in the middle. Wild. I do see the vulva for sure. And the side lock also reminds me because the followers of Dionysus were said to do that. And various um, monastics in India will do this. You'll see this to this day among the Gadaya Vaishnavites. They have the single lock of hair. Some forms of Shaivism have a single lock of hair. But it's very important, these uh, esoteric kind of haircuts. And, and they're letting them grow really long too. Right, like mm -hmm. not shaving the sides of the ears was a thing for the Hebrews, right? Yeah, Padawans in Star Wars, <laughs> they have one. Oh, the yeah, Jedi's. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, this is a shaman that's a, a red horn dedicated to the morning star with the side lock with the weird vulva plate on his head, um, that acts as a, a way to communicate with the stars. So, go to let's go to the next pick. I have a few questions about that figure. Yeah. yeah. Um, first, uh, Valerie was asking what it was made of, if you knew the stone material. Oh. It's like soapstone. Stone. Yeah, one was because it's easy to carve with. They had soapstones, and they had, oh, I, and I was looking up the stones that I forgot. Not onyx. Um, I did look it up. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Because that's well, how they traced it back to Cahokia. Cahokia was that it was from a certain um, quarry. Quarry, yeah. Okay. And my question was, could that disc be uh, partly remnants of the head binding? Like, well, yeah. Well, they did head binding, and they did they did head binding for the nobility and and in that culture, but the disc also. Um, it was it was copper plates, so it wasn't stone. It was a copper disc, and you and you might have seen from the the Phoenician in Spain, the women with those earrings on the side, those those big uh, disc earrings on the side in previous yeah. episodes. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of that of that, and supposedly it was yeah. some type of communication device. Nice, nice. Yeah, it reminds me of a lot of solar disc imagery that we've seen. Yeah, you know, and again, this imagery too of as above, so below. A common theme, well, you'll get is this idea of a cosmic womb, or a chaos gap, or a hole. You know, and if you look at that, if we go back, right? If you don't just consider this a vulva, it could also be that cosmic gap. And this idea of the as above, so below is so central to channeling. So I see hit this is like like Dion was saying, right? This is a funnel. 
that's drawing down the universe. It's reflective of the of the of the great sky itself, right? This is a microsm of that cosmic womb. And copper conducts uh, electricity, doesn't it? I think so. Okay. <laughs> that's wow. why they steal all the wires. Yeah. Down the street from my house. Um, so much. So this is wild right here. This is so, so part of the ritual at the, the Chunky game that they did was it was called the Black Drink, Yapon. I've heard and, of this. Yeah. And the Black Drink is made from holly, fermented holly, sometimes with datura and a couple other herbs. And what they're drinking it out of is a whelk shell. They would eat the whelks as well. And some whelks are psychedelic. This is whelks. We call them mollusk. You know, all the different episodes talking about the purple dye and the mollusk and the psychoactive ingredients in mollusk or MAOIs or sometimes DMT or the different dye properties. Well, within these tribes, they turned it into a drink and they and they would serve the black drink out of the whelk shell itself. That's how you had to serve it. Oh, wow. I know that these 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 drinks, these black drinks are they're per they're they're for purgation right like the the holly plant that they're using i believe it's called like the vomitoria plant or something is it's like you know and they and this is a very common right across most of the united states um like this was something that a lot of these groups are doing and a lot of this knowledge about how to actually produce these black drinks has been lost because a lot of them would be regional and would take on you know regional plant variations to produce various types of psychedelic effects well, they would toast the holly, sorry, like like how you toast coffee to bring out the caffeine. And part of the purgative effect is, you know, like after you throw up, sometimes you feel better, you get a little endorphin, right. you feel so. They would do it. They would purge, and then they would get that datura, and they they get it in there. They purge it out, and just get you know get it in and out, and they would feel good and play their games and. You can't yeah, underestimate the psychological effect of purging as well, especially if you've when you have most psychedelics, they give things meaning, you know, when everything becomes very uh, vivid to the imagination. So, so being sick or purging, they call it la purga still, don't they? So, I, I think be, being sick plus the feeling of extra meaning given by hallucinogenics just makes it very meaningful and you're getting rid of all that old horrible stuff in your psyche and i just think it's good for you and i, and I, I think it's uh, good symbolically for the way the brain works on yeah. i 100 agree ryan from personal experience you know it's usually one of the more trippier one of the more um you know uh, relevant parts of the experience because like you know um when you go through that purgation right there's this at least for me, every time I've had that, it's been also this connection, right? This is a part of you, but it's also waste, you know? Mm. And then it really extends those feelings of connection. Like, you know, if you're doing like a mushroom, right? Like on psilocybin mushrooms, you feel so interconnected to everything. So then when you go through that purgation experience, it's so visceral and raw. And you realize yeah. like you're no different than this, you know, effluence, <laughs> Mm, yeah, it's the ayahuasca. I mean, I, I always just so, remember looking into the bottom of a bucket and thinking, that's me in there. Right. You said it's the waste parts, but I, I was still, even though it was in the bucket, I was still connected to it. Yeah. Just the thing about psychedelics, they all, they all give uh, like a, a really impactful meaning to everything and, and make everything, it turns the volume upon things. Do, do you get me? So, like, you, you know, I'm I'm going for a short walk. Oh, this this walk means so much, not just to now, but to every day I've lived of my life previously and every day to come. It just that's what that's what they do. <laughs> that's very true. What are your thoughts on purgation, Dion? La purga. That's what they call it in, in South America. It's the purge. Mm. It gets rid of the emotional energies. It's a spiritual healing, and you know the shamans could determine how much purge they want. Depending on how much, because uh, you got banana banana stoppers, coffee, or P. viridis, psychotria viridis. So it's a male and female, the vine and the leaf put together. So you could put more or less of the one if you want it more visionary or more purgative. 
And right. it all depends on, on what you've ate or how you, how you feel with it, you know, because there's some people that don't purge and they feel guilty. Like, oh, I didn't purge. I, I didn't get it out. Mm. You, you can, you can take it and feel good. And sometimes you could take that same drink and not feel nothing. Wild. So that's how it works. So yeah, the, the black drink, the black sun, the eclipse, go to the next pick. So yeah, back to where we're talking about that the evangelicals are scared. There's an eclipse coming tomorrow. And that some people think think that Christ will return, second coming, the rapture. Other He's people think it's back. all this Luciferian apocalypse. That's the thing with Christians. Jesus is always coming back. They can't wait for the apocalypse. They love it. They're like they're rubbing <laughs> their hands, like, oh, it's gonna be over soon. It's like it's such a central theme. It's like if you go back to the earliest Christian writings, right? They're they're all wondering when, when's the apocalypse when's happening? It gonna happen? From day yeah. one, you know. <laughs> and when well, it doesn't I, I happen, like, they have to come up I with the rules and oh we we weren't ready yet. He wasn't ready for us. We had, we need to spiritually be ready and he'll come back then. It's our fault. We're all sinners. <laughs> I was uh, just referencing that last image, Dion. Uh, I, I noticed that uh, you, you had the, the moon eclipse and the sun. Well, when you think about it, that's because of something very weird. The sun and the moon are the same size. How strange is that? I understand the sun's much farther away. I'm not going flat earth here. But the moon and the sun to our eye and an eclipse can happen because they are the same size in the sky. How strange is that? Just the whole balance of the universe and all things considered, the sun and the moon are the same size. Well, what what does this have to do with anything? So I've got I've I've actually put one note down for this whole episode, and th and that is off the internet here. The average distance between the Earth and the Sun is 108 times the Sun's diameter. 108. We keep going about these numbers. 108 is a quarter of 432. So I'll read that again. The average distance between the Earth and the Sun is 108 times the Sun's diameter. The average distance of the Earth to the Moon is about 108 times the Moon's diameter. So I'll say it again. Isn't it funny that the Earth and the Moon are the same size? It seems <laughs> oblique, but those two things are very much linked. There's some Everybody there's some strange music of the spheres going on. There's no other planet that can have an eclipse, I don't think. Not 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 like the Earth can. There's lots of little small satellites around most planets. And this is something that's going to stop, right? Like the Moon is slowly moving away from us millimeter by millimeter every year and eventually it's going to get to a point where it will become tidally locked and only one side of the earth will ever experience the moon <laughs> i i don't think that'll happen that's that's the way science has it now but i, I the way i see all the the cosmic harmony is is that and this is speculative but uh, the, these things, you know, a bit in this direction will mean a bit in that direction. And it all just eventually seems to balance itself out. Or maybe it'll go flinging off like Space 1999. And uh, yeah, that would be cool too. All things are in flux. Nothing is ever static, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even if it comes together in this harmonious thing that's but a moment of harmony, you know. That's yep. the nature of the universe. <laughs> yeah, no, just to say one thing. I had the actual toy for Space 1999, the little spaceship. Oh, cool. The little white the spaceship. Button, you press the button yeah. and, and the thing shoots off, the, the capsule at the front. Cool. This is So you guys know, this is an old, obscure uh, TV show from from England 19, from 1970s. 1970-something, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like I was saying, I, I grew up on old English TV. Yeah, I remember you saying well, how so did you know. get that, by the way? I don't, I don't care about anybody else watching this. Eclipses, eclipses. How, how did you get British TV? I don't know. Was when I was just... a little kid, I was watching BBC in Hollywood in the 1970s. That's, That's why, because he lived in Hollywood, right? Yeah, there's TV everywhere. <laughs> German TV, Italian TV. Cool. Wild, wild, wild. But yeah, does anyone else have any other thoughts about the eclipse? 
I, I, I do, unless Buffy wants to get a word in edgeways. I'm taking it all in for right now. So I, I remember from my other studies that uh, the Greek was the Greek Hipparchus uh, found out that there was where he saw an eclipse. His mate in Egypt saw that the moon was only four fifths covered, and so with a bit of trigonometry, he worked out how far the moon was away. You're talking about so Thales. Cool. Yeah, you're talking Thales, about Thales. But is it Herodotus writes about it, but yeah, yeah, that's an awesome moment. Thales is freaking most people I can I can make up a Greek sounding name and they go, Oh, well, these sounds very clever, right? And you go, actually no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a nerd, leave me alone. <laughs> no, but you're right. You're it's not like you're you're not it's not like you're not talking about it. You, you're just talking about the you said the chronicler and the guy's name is Thales, yeah. But it's still yeah. the same story. So it's still yeah. so sorry, yeah. Uh, <laughs> What else about about eclipses? Uh, well, you know, for for a lot of science, general science, we found out a lot of, uh, because of eclipses. Uh, Einstein proved uh, general relativity because we we could see when the eclipse happened, we could see the light bent by stars that should be behind the sun, and we could see them at the side of the sun because of the gravity well around the sun. So, you know, lots of things are proven because of eclipses, which is pretty cool. There was, we thought there was a planet called Vulcan. We'd, we'd seen the, the wobble of, of uh, Neptune, not Uranus. We'd seen the wobble of Uranus and said, there must be another planet around there. And then when we looked, there was another planet making it wobble. And we'd seen that Mercury was wobbling as well near the sun. And we were like, oh, there must be another planet near there. So everyone kept looking at the eclipses, but didn't see a planet. And then eventually Einstein did his little test there with the light coming from behind, and we realized it was the gravity well around around the sun. Well, that's pretty cool. Not very that occult. Super cool. <laughs> oh, I don't know. You know, I think all of that stuff is still kind of occulted in a certain way, right? Like um, science is magic of another kind, in my in Absolutely. my view. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, you know, I have a special request at this time. For some live magical hoo haws. And I had asked Buffy if she had any incense or what you got, Palo Santo, anything that you could burn. And I'm requesting if anybody's out there watching right now, or if you watch this in the future, you got some incense, light a candle, light anything up, anything that you anything. Do that, that you consider magical. Um, transformation is what it's about. Because there's people out there, thousands of people, millions of people around the world right now think something's going to happen, some magical thing with this planetary alignment. Um, and supposedly, it's not just the eclipse. Some of the planets are going to be visible at the same time, seven planets or something. So, yeah, magical hoo transformation time. It could be just as small as something lighting a little Palo Santo, but it's symbolic of change and transformation in your life in a positive way. Not change and transformation that's out of your control, but you take in charge of the change and transformation and flowing with it. One thing I'd like time. to say about the eclipses is I was in totality in 2017, and I <clears throat> I seen how I don't know if everybody got to see pictures or videos of how it made like crescent moons everywhere there was like thousands of crescent moons everywhere yeah, in 2017 yeah. oh it was gorgeous i was yeah, like that's a, yeah that's a scientific thing that it's uh I, I think it's because of the size of the molecules in the atmosphere and what's going on it basically makes lots of little um what are those little pinhole cameras called camera obscura it makes oh. like Infinite camera obscuras everywhere. So that, yeah, oh. that's really, it's got it's got a name for it as well. I don't. Oh, know. it was it was just the most one of the most magical things I feel like I have experienced outside of you know other human experiences with other people and with the um I seen the Vesca Pisces in that eclipse. I was like holy mother you know and then after like shortly after the vesca pisces i seen that diamond 
you know, you'll see the di- that just that last piercing light is like a diamond mm-hmm. ring. I yeah. seen that, and then I seen the vest. I seen the vet the Vesca coming and going. So, and after that, major, major, major changes happened in my life. I have a full tarot spread on the ground. I took a picture of it. I need to go back and look at it. Should have been more prepared, but I was out of town. Sorry, guys. So. But yeah, it it like when you observe it, when you do ritual, it will bring changes in your life because it was it sent it seemed like it was like a domino effect where there was just things that just happened, 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 and it wasn't all it wasn't all bad. It was it was more good than bad, I would say, for the most part. So that's what I have to say on my personal experience with it. But from what I have just learned from Dion. I totally understand why in my area, the Cherokee said that it was bad omen to go out during an eclipse. I always wondered that, you know, I there's was, that whole idea in a yeah. lot of these cultures where they say that the, uh, this is when the, the gods are, are, are making love. Right. And you don't want to watch them making love. That's rude. <laughs> it, oh. it, and, so you know, in the Sorry, Navajo no. culture, they get school exemptions for kids during the eclipses that they can keep them at home and keep them indoors. It's mm. part, it, yeah. With the school, there's a school exemption during the eclipses that Native American children in certain tribes they don't they can't be forced to go to school because they have to be kept indoors because of religious beliefs. Mm-hmm. In Norway and Scandinavia and those places, it's a is it Fenrir? Is it's a giant wolf that swallows the the sun and. Uh, China is the same as dragons in China. Yeah, I was Although say I, will note, I will note that eclipses happen because of the lunar nodes crossing and the the eclipse, the path of the ecliptic. Uh, and the north and south lunar nodes in astrology are depicted as dragons in, in most cultures from China, India, and in the West. So that's interesting. Just more interesting things. Uh-huh. One of those things that because of its supreme imports and technological advancement becomes kind of like a near universal, like most astrology and astronomy, right? This, like we all have the similar kind of view about the, about the star signs and whatnot. And it's kind of interesting how pervasive some of this imagery is. And I think it's just because of the utility, honestly, you know, and the fact that the people who have this technology are traveling all around the world because they can pilot the seas, you know? Yeah, yeah. That is one of the main things you get out of it. It's navigation. Right. I mean, navigation is done by time at degrees of arc. Is It's all time. Exactly. And it's so essential. It's so essential. Like, especially if you're out on the open ocean where there are no landmarks, nothing. You know, can you imagine you're in a tight, especially Bronze Age, you're in a tiny dinghy in the middle of the ocean at night. <laughs> How terrifying would that be? Right. And then you're 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 relying on some little, you know, small device that you have to line up with the light of the sun in order to gauge where you are. I know where we are. I've seen that dolphin before. (laughs) Just wild to think, you know, how intense. And even if you go back earlier, can you imagine the first peoples who who crossed all of these island chains and like went to Australia or went to like Hawaii? Like, how the heck did they get to Hawaii? And, like, I don't think they did it without having ne- knowledge of navigation. This is the thing. This is, like, there ancient, to be ancient, a first, ancient, ancient knowledge, you know? Yeah, that, there has to be a first to do it, though. That's the thing. But you know what men are like. They're idiots. That's true. <laughs> well, you know, I've seen here in California, they do it once a year. Um, they would uh, paddle from Hawaii. For Hawaiian sovereignty, the warriors on a canoe, on on a Hawaiian ship, they paddle all the way from Hawaii to California. That's, That's so impressive. So in- intense. And like, pull up and say like, ooh, 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 and then turn around and go back home. Wow. Just, I bet they have massive just, muscles. Yeah, just for a little juju, just because Hawaiians, see, because with Hawaiian sovereignty, it deals with this, all right. Years ago, kids, if you wanted to learn Hawaiian language. That was called, that was considered a foreign language. What Your own language was considered a foreign language what? at school? Yeah, oh, that's and the reason being because uh, all right, 
when when the boats went there, I think that was Captain Cook, um, took over the islands originally. They had to stop there because it was on their on their trade routes. And King Kamehameha didn't want nothing from them. He had a hundred wives, waterfalls, paradise. They were all warriors. You've seen what Hawaii looks like. It's in a fantasy world. And he said, and they said, well, well, we can give you money. And he goes, well, I don't need it. Well, put it in the banks in Europe for me. And then they sent his sons to, to learn English language and study in the, you know, the English system or the, the European system. And it just collected interest in the banks there. And that's the, one of the reasons why Hawaii could never go sovereign. It has to be a California state. Or, I mean, a United States has to be where it's considered a state of America. Because if it was sovereign, they would have to give him back all that money and all the interest. It would make him one of the richest nations on the planet. Mm. And so that's why. And they, and they need that spot. And that's why Hawaii bombed it. I mean, uh, Japan bombed it. That was part of World War II. Little old Hawaii was part of World War II. Well, this is the thing, too, that a lot of people forget is that, like, Hawaii wasn't even a state at World War II. And there was a huge, like, you know, we've got to remember, right? And I mean this with all due respect, but um, America is very prejudiced and very exclusionary, you know, in its idea and its ideology. So there was there was a big seed of doubt as to whether they could rally the American populace to rise up when Hawaii was bombed because Hawaii wasn't a state, right? And it was largely indigenous at that time, you know, it, which is which is wild to think about, you know, because it wound up becoming such a powerful symbol. We're still talking about Pearl Harbor, you know, all mm -hmm. of these years later, but it's it, it was debatable whether or not that was going to sell, you know, at a certain point. And it's like, I remember reading too, um, the the uh, prejudice like the colonialization of of Hawaii is extraordinarily recent, but it was also one of the most intense. You know, to the point where there's very few, like there are not too many, and I mean this with all due respect, but like th there isn't a lot of pure blooded indigenous people anymore because a lot of them were just were, were killed or were you know forced out or all this you know through the this colonial process. It was just it was very very dark. And this is very recent history that people are just not aware of, you yeah. know? And you know what? what's also wild in Hawaii is harp. Mm -hmm. If you know what harp is, mm -hmm. harp, not the little harp that you play. No. Um, <laughs> the telescope. Yeah. Are you talking about the telescopes? I know that's a big it, deal in Hawaii. It's an array yeah, of fishes, isn't the, it, for weather the one control? In Alaska or in Antarctica mm -hmm. somewhere, wherever it's at. Well, they got a sister harp that's in Hawaii. It's, a, it's a, what it is. It's an array of antennas, and the way harp works is it all shoots at the same time. A, a bunch of antennas shoots a signal to the same spot in the sky, and it kind of glassifies it, and it makes a mirror. So it makes it so they can make a, a reflective to reflect the rays. It so what it does harp concentrates signals all at once, so it's it or attenuates. So mm -hmm. you know it's, you have it, to be careful with that, Dion. It might cause a fire or something. Like, yeah. oh, wait, I'm sorry. Conspiracies. We're not a conspiracy channel. I got to keep telling people that this is the cult of floors. We are <laughs> not, but if Just you thinking out loud. areas where there's more than two harp locations, they're all over the world. But you know, we do talk often though about these certain special places in the world, and Hawaii is one of these places, and we have to acknowledge this because. Hawaii is one of the natural observatories, right? The the in the indigenous Hawaiians had access to these. There's a reason why these mountains are so sacred. People could climb up to the top and they could see the universe in all of its glory. And our scientists, like NASA, is still fighting <coughs> for access to these sacred mountains to this day, right? Because they are the best spots on Earth for observing the universe, and they don't want to give them up. You know, and it's become this huge uh, sovereignty issue, right? That's still on playing in, in Hawaii to this day, right? Does NASA have right to these? It's to these a tough mountains? one, that isn't it? Yeah, it's a tough one. That do we, you know, is there a greater thing to be gained for the world, or should we respect these essentially superstitions? Well, I went in. I did well, some but, of the but a meaningful. I'm not. I'm not oh, degrading oh, them superstitions. No, no, no. But uh, I went and did some very meaningful. Reading. 
I went and did some deep diving into this. And from the scientists themselves, the um, it's it appears that the only real difference would be um, download time. That Hawaii is a the is a better spot for downloading. But with technology now and the type of telescope that they're building, there were a couple of different proposed sites. Like one of these sites is in Mexico, and the Mexican people want the freaking telescope there, and the site would be almost as good. Like. The only issue is download time and size of files. Like the scientists would have to make some compromises, but it's this, you know, it's this belief that we know we need to go to the best place. If we're going to do it, mm -hmm. we got to do it right. And, you know, who everyone should just bend over backwards because we are exploring the universe. And I'm like, it's this kind of incredible hubris that blows my mind. It's like, just go to Mexico. Like, what's the big deal? <laughs> you know, they want the telescope. Let the Hawaiian people have their sacred mountain. Like, come on. I mean, without knowing the subject, that sounds fair to me. Yeah. Right. No, no. Yeah. I guess, yeah, it's something you got to do some research on, but it's, it's, it's weirdness, you know? And it's, again, it's always this thing where like the powers that be get to control all of these sites, these of importance and get to, to cordon them off and make them exclusive. Like that, you know, I, I'm, I'm sick and tired of that, whether it's for science or not, you know? Or you have to pay a big fee, like, okay, can I get on my box, please? So now they're charging everyone to park in the Smoky Mountains. And I'm like, my family's like founders of these areas, right? I have to pay to park just to go into nature up there, right? That my, I mean, these were pioneer people. So, and just the capitalism is out of control. It's out of control. And if I want to do anything on this eclipse, it's to send energy out to rein in these greedy, capitalistic, corporate buttholes. <laughs> I love that, Buffy. You're a hero. That's so beautiful. With that said, I want to pull a couple cards for this eclipse, right? Dion was asking for magic. Let's 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 see some some transformative magic. Yeah, you guys want some snapping? Please. I'm not. Hey, go on, Snappy. I do that professionally, you know. <laughs> no, you do. I there mean, one episode. I, I was going to try and talk over here. <laughs> Sorry. Awesome, I was going to say, what episode I, I was going to try and talk you into doing it for me. But you just did it spontaneously anyway, so it was fine. There you go. <laughs> All right, our first card. We have the Prince of Swords. Prince of Swords. Right, so this is that immature energy um, that's situated in that logic mindset. So I always see this as that young, irrational young man who's out to prove their opinions mm. to the world, right? And they kind of do it in this, even if they have the best ideas, they don't know how to get their ideas across. You know what I mean? It's that- they just um, charge in head first all the time. Exactly, right? It is logic, right? Like these people often have the, uh, good ideas or well thought out, well placed emotions, but you can't just get stuff done. You have to learn to compromise and work. And mind you, this, this, this is a reading of the eclipse of, of the energy of the the eclipse of the the energies around it the people um who who exactly is this directed towards we can say just our, our community of friends in general and people who watch these videos and and, and you know i'm just want to get a, 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 a gauge where we're going and what we need to focus on right so like next we have the queen of discs this is Buffy energy. <laughs> this is the yes. this is Capricorn, right? This is that feminine energy of building and of working through her family and protecting her family. So seeing these two energies connected, right? There's that young rash side that wants to go and change the world quickly and immediately. You muted. Oh, you got it. I was like, well, that slow energy, <laughs> kind of like building 
and doing the actual real. So here's the difference between these two cards, right? Is what I see is like, this is the ultimate pragmatist. This is that energy of seeing long-term into the future, right? Like say these two people both want to bring about some kind of personal freedom, right? This is the guy who charges in guns blazing and says, let's start a revolution. This is that energy of slowly actually building a grassroots movement into the future that she may never even see, right? But she will, you know, <laughs> both kind of going for that same kind of thing, but through very different means. What do you guys think? I, 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 I think the, the, the discs lady in my decks called the matron of discs and that she's this uh nursing energy you you've seen her she's uh basically mary poppins on on mine she's got a couple <laughs> little uh goat kids with her and she's raising them and nurturing them and 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 you know it's not for her they're not her kids she's she just is the person that raises children uh, a matron in the british health service back in the day it's not quite the same anymore but she was the lady that, that ran the ward. You'd have the doctors and the nurses and everybody listened to the matron. The doctors had a, a little bit more sovereignty than the nurses, but the doctors could certainly get a bollocking from the matron. And so she's this, but she she's doing it with a, a wisdom. Uh, and uh, she's, she's like the, the, the local crone lady to, so, to, to some extent. She's been there, she's done it, she's seen it, and she knows how to do it. Look, she's brought so many children into the world, you wouldn't she probably brought you into the world. Right. Right. To me, this is the this is the feminine energy at its most pragmatic, most concerned with family, most concerned with security, most concerned with that with that practicality. You know, so it's that feminine energy devoted to it's like this that mama who's gonna protect her it's a mama bear protecting her cubs you know mm -hmm. it's the very very powerful pragmatic pragmatic down-to-earth energy you know what's interesting However, go ahead wait wait though snappy wait come on now I turn love... them upside down now snappy <laughs> turn them upside down yeah yeah the the, the reverse side of this right <laughs> the reverse side of this energy is this is also the feminine at its most domineering it is, it is its most controlling and it's most um, callous, right? Um, it's that energy of ab that's it's it's control. It's not that control of the masculine energy which which will lock you in a room, you know, lead, follow, get out of the way. No, this is that energy of guilt, of, mm. of, of redirection. Yeah, right the pressure of of logically telling you what you're doing right. is wrong. Like you said, it's that matron energy of, I know what's best. And if you're going to challenge what I know, you better have a better solution. <laughs> well, we can, we can bring it to a, a bedside manner. You said calloused. And, and I would say she's very calloused. It's, so I, I had an injury once. And uh, when I was having the cast taken off, the doctor looked at me and said, well, you're never going to run again. I mean, I can run again now. I just didn't listen to him. But uh, he said, you're never going to run again. And that's his calluses. That's his, his, he's seen all this so many times. He can just walk up to somebody he doesn't know and say to them, oh, by, by the way, you're disabled now and not think anything of it and not think that my psychology might be impacted if there is a small chance that I can heal from it. In fact, there was a big chance I could heal from it. But That's a really good know. point. When these two energies come come together, right? You have this person who says, like, logically, things should all be peace, love, and freedom. And then the queen is like, yeah, but the wolves are just outside the gates. And if you mm. don't defend yourself against the wolves, they're going to eat you, you know? And yeah. she's that's the energy, right? She's telling you straight. Yeah. Well, e equally, I, I think she might push you out to the wolves and say, like, look, the wolves are out there. You're just going to have to deal with the wolves now. And they're going, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. I, I've, I've never really. No, no, go. Go. Then I've seen wolves before. You'll be fine. Off, Ryan. And you yeah, no, don't. To the wolves. <laughs> the, uh, the final card for the trip. I, I would never. Don't I feed me it. to the wolves, Buffy. <laughs> <laughs> for our final card for the uh, for these three card reading here, we got the truth, four of swords. 
Oh. Right, so more of that sword energy and connected with this queen in the middle. So I think it's pretty clear here. This is about learning to, um, we have this righteous anger and this knowledge and this advanced knowledge about the truth of things, or at least a truth that exists in this current reality in the present. And the point though is just because you know what's right doesn't mean you need to go rushing in with this immature aggressiveness, right? This is about being pragmatic about this, right? You don't want to lose this passion, but at the same time, you know, you got to, you got to keep things in check and you got to know what you're doing. You know, if you just, to me, like this is that young revolutionary energy, the person who goes to protest and then gets themselves thrown in jail, you know, <laughs> right? And then now what use are you to the revolution? You're in jail. You know? Well, right? I would say that, that the four, the four swords are bringing a, a calmness to everything. Everything's getting balanced out. And there's a something of a foundation there, although it's air, so it's volatile and not very fixed. There, there's, there's, there are four things balancing out, and I, I believe in Crowley's deck, it is actually called peace or truce. It's truce, truce. yeah. The esoteric truce. title is truce. Uh -huh. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's these, it's fire, water, air, and earth balanced out in mind, and so with this. Uh, the, these two court cards we've got, if they're going to balance out, it'll be somewhat in peace or certainly with peace of mind. So whatever feelings they might have, you know, if we've got this voracious energy and this this domineering feminine energy, they, they, they must be calm. They must be sat down before they begin to speak to each other. That's a good point. That's a good point. You know, and yeah, maybe this is like your thing here. Maybe these are representative of two types of energies within this kind of community. You know, right. you have that, that controlling, pragmatic feminine that says, I know what's best. And then you have this young masculine that's like, I'm out to change the world. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know? well, I want to tell you, <laughs> my overview here is, is that, okay, with, with like the community like Eclipse in mind, you have, you have, you know, fast as fuck boy, air sign, and then slow as shit mama in the earth sign. So you have a balance. You have a truce right after. So you have the two opposites coming together in a truce, right? Right. Yes. So, yeah. And the, and it's like, it's that's that middle. Because if you have something going, you know, not like it's opposites attract right there too plus you have air which is the most unpredictable element and earth which is the most predictable element so you have several aspects of it being in its opposite and then you have the truce so i see it as a milding and out an amalgamation of energies and things to be able to uh come to fruition that you know everybody seems to be working towards yeah. And like Ryan said, it's that balance of mind, right? This truce mm -hmm. is in the mind. This is about using that logic and recognizing that mm -hmm. the fight is stupid. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like maybe you don't need to be arguing or, or you know, any con any any incongruence is not worth it necessarily. Mm -hmm. Right. Even if it is a fight, which it's not, it, it's yeah. not a fight. But if it was a fight, uh, the best fighters know that you, you've got to stay calm before a fight. Absolutely so calm, calmer than you normally would be in a fight, just so you can see what's happening and you're not pre-deciding what you're going to do. Because going down that path, you're not going to have the reaction time and you're going to get whacked. So right. I, I think, uh, you know, that they, they call it uh, mushin, like means no mind, nothing going on at all in your head. And, and, I, and I think often when we talk to each other or debate you'll see two people arguing or, or debating and one person is clearly not really listening they're thinking of the next thing they're going to say rather than listening to what the person's going to say and this isn't no mind this 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 you're not going to win this one no one's going to win that if that's how you're thinking you've got to listen and respond to what's been said what's been put on the table this is the this is the truce 
this is the pact this is how you sit down and and discuss something and, and sign something out and become friends right now that's a very good point right that's the difference between like a beneficial debate and one of these antagonistic debates you know that amounts to nothing um right and uh yeah i think yeah yeah i think you said it so well it's uh, that energy of learning to learning to compromise Mm. you know so much and about a truth so important with those with those energies you've got to compromise if not you're just going to destroy each other whether it's a thought a, 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 an action or a deed you've got to compromise when those two when they're so opposed you know so, well not i won't say opposed just opposite that much of an opposite right well, you know what it is, too? It's like, you know, in some ways, like this queen energy is this immovable mountain, you know? And the air, the air is not that kind of energy that can move mountains, you know? <laughs> right? Like, uh, so it can, it's going to scream and it's going to try to bring about some kind of revolutionary change. But that's not how you bring about change with the, with the queen. If you attack the queen, the queen just, you know... Uh, they just buckle down. They buckle down deeper into the earth. You know, you have to do it through this kind of truce and compromise. The, the only way you get through to the queen of discs is through that logic. So it's the right approach. It's just showing up in an immature way. If this was the night, things would be moving in a very different energy. You know, I'd use pastries or milkshake or some kind of a treat with her. If I wanted yeah. to move that mountain, it would be a chocolate bar or any Claire or a kid. Right. But yeah. So fun little reading. So I think, yeah, guys, learn to to balance the mind and your practicality, you know, and let these incongruencies grow. Now is the time for maturity and for truce, you know? Truce. Sorry, a kitten <laughs> came on the screen. I didn't hear anything anyone said. <laughs> <laughs> but this has been so much fun, guys. Um, any other thoughts about our eclipse before we start to wind down here? Truce. Hmm. I call it truce. Well, <laughs> I, I, I feel like you just said truce then, and it is that there's almost a truce going on, isn't there, as the sun and the moon kind of come come together and, and team up a little bit there. Right. That's so true, right? And I feel like this is a, such an important image at the heart of the eclipse is the yin and yang, the merging of the masculine and the feminine, mm -hmm. and that 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 rebirth of the phonies, right? The unity of the, the 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 black sun and the bright sun of the day. You know, you're taking. We often examine these things as separate. You know, the sun and the moon, but they're fundamentally it's one force. You know, and as above, so below. This is reminding us when all of this stuff lines up, you get a glimpse back into that cosmic womb, back into that moment before creation, and this is about that unity, that divine truce. Yeah, I, I just thought, I just thought of another annoying mathematical fact. Uh, we were talking about the 108 before with the distance between the, the Earth and the Moon being 108 times the distance between the, the diameter, sorry, the diameter of the Moon. Well, the radius of the Moon is 180,000 miles or 108,000 miles. It's 108 anyway. There you go. Right. Another one. Gosh. I, nine yeah. again. Nine comes up everywhere, eh, Dion? It's always <laughs> nine. Yeah, it's always nine. <laughs> <laughs> that video we just did the uh, reaction to that last door was 108, and you had to explain the mystery to me, Snap, because it didn't hit me. Yeah, I got them to watch um, a song by this band called the Lennon Clay Pool Delirium, right. and it's called Satori. And in the in the song, the guy goes inside of his mind, and then he's like this claymation eye, and he comes up to this big doorway, and the door is marked. 108 and then he opens the door and that's the entrance to his mind and i'm like oh you're going through the ninth gate right, right and then when he wakes up when he goes through the door he wakes up as this buddha and it's the third eye opens up and it's an eye it's like a womb and an eye it's a really awesome video everyone should check it out that reminds me of that statue 
right? Yes. It's called well, Satori. I was thinking about that too. Yeah, I was like, oh, this is uncanny, you know? The synchronicities are just uncanny to me, yeah. So 108, someone asks here, it says, 108, isn't that about the number of skulls on the necklace? So this is a sacred number within Hinduism and Shaivism. And uh, yes, wow. 108 is the number of skulls that Kali has, the number of skulls that Shiva has. It's the number of beads you have. Like I have a big thing of Rudraksha beads right here. So these are called the Tears of Rudra. And you have 108 of these. And you're supposed to chant your mantra on these beads, you know? And this is what you would use in, in, in the Shaivite tradition. Um, yeah. Or in the Shakti, the goddess tradition. Satori. <clears throat> Satori is the name of the music video I mentioned. It's called Satori mm -hmm. by the Lennon Claypool Delirium. It's really, I mean, Claypool does anything is, is magical. Yeah, and Sean Lennon is actually really, really good. You, you know, it, it's not, it's not nepotism. He's, he's actually a great songwriter in his own right. Um, yeah, phenomenal band. Everyone should check it out. Yeah. All right, so let's wind down then. Um, Buffy, any final words for our audience today? Be as, be so specific with your wishes, desires, and spell workings that it pains you and keeps you up at night because that it it needs to be that specific so you get exactly what you want and not something that you don't. Yeah, I love that. How about you, Ryan? Any final words for the audience today? Why are you grinning? Because I normally make up stupid words like mm -hmm. penguin. What did I say last time? Penguin, <laughs> icebox. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I I, th I think what's fun about eclipses and such is is that you have these great big epic things that happen outside you. You know, it's this the the these rare cosmic markers of life and these unusual things. And every now and again, the universe can out of its relative clockworkness can give you these little surprises and, and they make you think, they affect you somehow deep in your soul because they are so epic and unusual. And and it's nice to it's nice to be alive and 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 to sense these things and, and to interact with them and feel the emotions. And you know, it's 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 like a real film. This is something extra that's been written for you. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? It's difficult to grasp at. It's a cosmic dance. That's beautiful. Yeah. I love it. And it, it's beautiful to, to be to be called to join in with the dance from time to time. Yeah. 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 That's so well said. Love it. Yeah. Any last thoughts, Dion? Oh, you already know. Live your best life. Or attempt to. <laughs> well said. You know, and for this eclipse, I just, you know, this is a time of transformation. This is a time of change and growth. See this as a renewal and go out and experience the beauty of nature. Try to witness it if you can. If not, watch it through the magic of technology. That's still natural. But go out and perceive the wonders of nature. Um, peace and love, everyone. This was a lot of fun. Um, and we'll be back next week with um, our cult exploration into France. So uh, that'll be a lot of fun. And Dion gets some, got some wild stuff. He found, um, there's this really cool book called Le Ba, which is by this guy, J.K. Hoisman, which talks about the satanic mass. And it was written in like the 1800s in France. Dion found a version by Norman Mailer, the American playwright, that was only published in Playboy magazine, and he managed to get his hands on it. So, yeah, yeah, it's that one will be interesting. It will get into some of the French satanic cults and how it leads up to our modern times, and you yeah. know some juicy, spicy, wild stuff. Going to be I'd, so. I'd like fun. you to do an episode at some point just on how Dion does his research. I'm just fascinated, like how. how where, where are you going? How are you pulling these strings together? Are you just asking the muse and, and letting your fingers go? What's the going muse, on, Dion? The muse, the muse. The, the mystery it's, of Dion's research. 
it happens yeah. like little portals and rabbit holes. It just hops from one, you know, and you get an, an inkling to go click on something else and it leads and it's all connected. Is that how it works with you, Dion? Exactamundo. Yeah. The muse, the muse, the muse. And a little AI every now and then. Yeah, like Donson is saying here, some AI, but but you gotta you gotta know how to coerce the AI. Dion's got some tricks, but it is all the muse. Like I always think of um, Dr. Ammon has this really fun anecdote where uh, he's hanging out with Carl Ruck and a couple other classicists, and Carl yeah. Ruck is kind of amazed always by this. He does this. Um, it's called the sortes, where you pull a random mm -hmm. text. And then the muse gives you a message. And Carl Ruck goes, Ammon, demonstrate the sortes. And Ammon goes, fine, I'll find you. I'll find you the drugs. And he randomly pulls out a copy of Satyricon, opens it up to the purple anus. <laughs> <laughs> and this Ruck and Ammon had been looking for for years because they knew it would be there, but they couldn't find it. And then they found it in plain Greek, like full-on oh. purple anus and he just pulled it off his shelf in front of everyone that's how the muse works yeah you know? <laughs> how the muse works. those who it's can so, do it well so if, if I'd, i've been dying to tell dion this story so i've actually told this to you before snappy okay. but dion uh so how i found the occult explorers right so i'd been i'd had some binaural beats on at night and that daytime, or oh, for, for a couple of weeks, I'd gotten really stuck on Ganymede. Ganymede's always sticking his bottom out. He wants it to be purple, if you get it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I didn't know this at the time. And so, it, you know, who do you want? Nobody knows that stuff apart from you guys, and, and, and I'm on. And and so that night, I I'd, I'd, had some binaural beats on. I was in a very deep place. And uh, an African chief came to me and he said the word to me, Nematon. And I'm like, oh, whoa, what's that? Oh, Nematon? I don't know, what's, what's all that? And so the day after, I was like, what did that African chief say to me last night? Okay. Nematon. So I typed it in and it, it turned out it was a Celtic word or similar uh, from, from Greek that was a, a sacred grove or garden. And so I typed it in on YouTube, Sacred Grove, and your was it your first video came up? I think it was like a, a few weeks after you'd made it, but it was your first video. And then, obviously, a few months later, I've said, hey, Snappy, I'm a person too. And Snappy <laughs> said, hello, do, do you want me to talk to you? And so we, we had a chat, and, I, and I'd said that, uh, who, who sent the African chief to me? And then I was told stories about your journeys to Africa. So I, th I think you had a, a, a friend in Africa Oh, I had a friend in Africa somehow that sent me to you. How um, much that? I, I, I got the it. answer. I got the answer to Ganymede, which was the amazing thing. The Tansy. Well, I, I designed my room like Africa. I live in an African rainforest. My bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> I love that awesome. room. Yeah. But yeah, but, there you go. Yeah, we can't finish an episode, can we? We, no. we, we, somebody says something and then it's another hour. We're too cool for school, y'all. So we need to it's get true. you guys back together again to just uh, trade stories. You need to pick Dion's brain because he's got so many stories from his travels in Africa and South America and just his experiences in life. I'm sure you guys can go at it for hours. So we'll have to do this again. I would like to do that, actually. <laughs> I would like that, actually. We'll start with that. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll make it work. All right, everyone, peace and love, and uh, make sure you subscribe to Ryan7 and to Buffy, Occult Examiner. All right, mm -hmm. links in the uh, description. Take care, everyone. Hey,